everyone has just joined. Um, we want to welcome you to Parenting in a Pandemic, the Early Years. Uh, this event today is put on by the YAA as part of the Careers Life in Yale programming in coordination with Yale Women NYC. It's great to see so many Yaleys convened here on this very important topic. Uh, we're excited to learn more together from our terrific experts and panelists on what is at the forefront of many of our minds and beings on a daily basis, how to best parent and educate young children in the midst of a pandemic. My name is Sterling Thomas. I'm a Yale College alum and a member of the YAA Board of Governors. I'm also a co-head of Yale Women NYC. And I, along with my co-producer and fellow board member, Elaine Gustafson, as well as the terrific YAA staff and panelists, welcome you. A note about the format of our program today, my colleague Elaine will introduce our panelists who will give a short overview pre presentation on core areas of interest around the topic at hand, followed by addressing some Q&A that was submitted prior to the meeting with the balance of the time devoted to Q&A as it comes in. Please feel free to submit your questions in the chat section of Zoom um, and we'll get the questions to the panelists during the Q&A time that we have. We'll wrap around four shortly thereafter. With that, I'll hand it over to Elaine, but Thank you for being here. And to those of you who are raising, caring for, educating, or just involved with our youngest members of society during this time with the unique challenges and factors in every situation, we'll say this in good confidence. Thank you and that you're probably doing a really good job. So with that, let's uh, meet our panelists and get some information and questions answered. Elaine? Good afternoon, everyone. As, as Sterling said, my name is Elaine Gustafson. I'm a pediatric nurse practitioner and a graduate of Yale School of Nursing and uh, on the Board of Governors of the YAA with Sterling. Uh, it's really my privilege and pleasure to introduce our speakers today, both of whom I've known for many years as colleagues and as friends. Uh, Angela Crowley is a pediatric nurse practitioner and a professor emerita at Yale School of Nursing. She provided pediatric primary care in various practices in Connecticut for more than 40 years. Um, but her professional involvement for over 30 years has focused predominantly on early care and education and the improvement of health and developmental outcomes for young children and their families. Angela, in addition, provides consultation to six affiliated, Yale-affiliated child care centers uh, and serves on the COVID-19 Public Health uh, task, force, task Force for Child Care Aware America. Uh, so uh, we are delighted to have Angela with us. And in addition, we have Deborah Fairholt, who is a pediatrician and a clinical professor at Yale University. She received her pediatric training at Yale as well. Uh, Deb practiced primary care for over 45 years, uh, I believe on Church Street right there in New Haven. Uh, she has the distinction of being one of the founders of the Pediatric Nurse Practitioner Program at Yale. Uh, she's specially trained in behavioral and developmental pediatrics. Uh, she too has provided consultation to child care programs for several decades and has acted as a consultant and support for families during this pandemic. We welcome Angela and Deborah and look forward to hearing their presentation. Thank you so much. Um, I'm Angela Crowley and with Debbie Fairholt, we're really delighted to do this presentation. Um, I want to say that not only for all of you, but we also are parents of adult children and we have grandchildren. So this, this issue is very personal for us as well. Um, I also wanna say that I'm delighted to, uh, to, to do this for all of you. We were very excited when Elaine contacted us. We've known her for decades. And uh, Debbie and I have been friends and colleagues for many, many years. And we really share a passion for providing uh, exceptional pediatric primary care for children and adolescents, and also ensuring that all children and families have access to quality uh, childcare. Uh, next slide, please. Great, and next slide. Um, I think there's a previous slide. 
Great. Uh, just to recap, what we're going to do um, during this session, and Sterling has also mentioned the format, uh, Debbie and I are going to share presenting some basic information, much of which you probably already know about COVID-19 and certainly the impact on children, families, and the child care system. And we'll really be focusing on strategies for parenting uh, during this certainly unprecedented and challenging time. Next slide. Um, I just wanted to reflect for a moment. We have all been living this extraordinary, unprecedented national and global challenge. And I'm sure just like all of you, I can remember waking up about nine months ago and suddenly realizing that we were experiencing something that we had never done before in our entire life. And we were doing it not only as citizens of the United States, but also as citizens of the world. And it really has been an amazing challenge that all of us have faced. Um, certainly we are all feeling what they call COVID fatigue. It has really been a long haul. Uh, certainly with all the breaking news around vaccines, we're excited about um, the future but we know that we're going into, at least in the, the Northern Hemisphere, we're going into a long winter, we're going into holidays where everything really needs to change so that we can stay healthy and safe. We all have lived through learning about this novel coronavirus. We've experienced this extraordinary evolution of science and prevention. I'm sure you can remember as I can, what we didn't know quite what to do in the spring. Um, we knew there was respiratory transmission. We didn't understand it uh, as thoroughly. Scientists did not understand it and it, it was unclear about what kinds of prevention we should take other than masks and social distancing. I'm sure you can remember cleansing, cleaning off everything that you brought into your home. We've learned so much, scientists and um, uh, physicians around treatment uh, that it's just been an extraordinary experience in science and of course again vaccine development uh, that has really moved much faster than expected. Next slide please. Uh, Debbie? Um, I, I thought this was your slide but that's okay. <laughs> um, the, there are several problems here with the science. One is that it keeps changing. The second is that many of us have lost confidence in the governmental agencies because of all the political pressures. But we do our best to keep reading and learning and knowing what's happening. One of the biggest problems with COVID-19 is that 40 to 50% of the people are asymptomatic and you know what that means. So it's all the precautions we take and everything we do is meant to mitigate the transmission of the virus. You can't actually control it completely for sure. And so it's layer upon layer upon layer of efforts to mitigate. This leads to the fatigue. Also to people feeling, well, maybe it doesn't work. So it takes a lot of work on everybody's part. Um, there's a statistic, 550,000 cases um, and so many deaths. I think today I read it was 250,000 people. Anybody with a chronic condition and people in my age group, the older folks are much more vulnerable. Children don't have it a lot, but they certainly have it. Hundreds of thousands of cases of children have it. It is clear they don't spread it as much, especially the young children. The high school kids are much more like adults. There is a terrible complication, which fortunately is rare, called the multi-system inflammatory syndrome or MICS. It represent, it re, I'm sorry, it's similar to Kawasaki's disease, which is a, has limit, we have limited understanding, but it's a multi-system inflammatory. They don't know the cause. Um, it can be treated and there are lasting effects in a few percentage of the children with especially cardiac complications. The vaccine status changes daily. We now know that there are two vaccines high up in the pipeline, 94, 95%. The actual trials on that and delivering the vaccines and getting it widely applicable is going to take a very, very, very long time. I would say a year, although healthcare workers may be able to get vaccinated in the early, late winter, early spring. Next slide. 
I think also we mentioned that I don't think there are any trials for vaccines for children yet. Well, I, what I understood last week from the Yale folks is that they've okayed it for children down right. to age 12. And I just saw today in the news, they're pushing right. for younger and they will do younger children. Right, good. I think that the child development principle is something I really love to talk about. I think parenting is the hardest job anybody can possibly do. You know, you think being a CEO of a, of a big company is hard. I've never done that, but being a parent is very hard. We have lots of ideas of what's good, what we'd like to do. We all have experience of having been children, watched our parents succeed more or less, and we hope that we can do a good job. And parenting is always a series of forward steps, maybe a backward step, and a plateau. And so it takes a lot of thought and persistence to do it as best you can. The most important thing is that young children need love and attention. If they can have this with consistency and security, they will develop the ability to be resilient to all the trials that come after that. Unconditional love doesn't mean you don't discipline your children. It just means that you are very, 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 very reliable. And they get this not because of what you say to them, but how you act. And so if they are in need, you try to help them. I would also like to say that all children, but it's a little bit harder to see in young children, are very much a barometer of their parents and the grown-ups teachers in their life. So that if the grown-ups can keep their balance and their own sense of security intact, even when they're worried, that does get transmitted to the children and makes them feel more secure. For preschool children, you have to adjust your explanations where do babies come from, questions about sex, questions about lying, questions about discipline. And as they get older, they have more verbal capabilities. Again, you don't wanna tell them more than they can digest. You wanna um, adapt it for their particular age and their verbal capabilities. It's very important to be honest. When you're not honest, they'll know it and then it'll come back and really hurt your relationship. The relationship is truly everything. Um, even if you're uncertain about things, you can say that mommy, daddy, we feel badly too that we don't have an answer, but there are people who are working to find these answers. Sometimes you'll have, as a pediatrician, a, someone in the family has cancer and the kids want to know, is that person going to die? And you have to talk about it, honestly. You can't predict the future. You can say people are working on it and we are sure that there will be a vaccine and that we will be able to go back to school. We don't know when, but it will happen. So honest reassurance is the right thing to do. Next slide. Little children, as I said, are very sensitive to the parents' moods. And even if they don't know, understand the words, they get the tone and the expression. For toddlers, and I think this is true for children, as well, infants as well, and anybody, some kind of consistency and routine is critical. It will reassure them that life goes on. There's some things that are dependable and predictable. Not everything can be routinized and perfectly consistent, but you do your best to make that happen. Um, I think the preschoolers, as we said, need simple explanations about what's happening. The school age children, um, are much more sophisticated, but they're not up there in terms of really abstract thinking. So depending on their verbal abilities, their age, what things they've gone through in the past, you will adjust the things that you say to them accordingly. It takes doing, it's a dance, even they may not have done it before. There's no quick and easy solution. There's no quick fix for all this. So you're working, working, working all the time. Next slide. As Debbie mentioned, um, parenting, we really believe is the hardest job there is. And I can't imagine a harder job during the pandemic. Um, parents of children under 21 who have young children, school age, adolescents, are struggling with these multiple priorities. Um, and I can see as a grandparent how difficult it is for my daughter. Um, and while I'm there to support, to advise, she and her husband have to make the decision. Do I send 
my six-year-old to kindergarten? Do I choose hybrid? Do I choose remote? What are the implications for all of that? Um, so parents are struggling with this every day. And then they are also usually dealing with elders in their family. And we know that elders are um, uh, potentially more fragile with this virus, uh, certainly those with chronic conditions. Um, they're dealing with extended family. And on top of all of this, they are trying to work. They're dealing with community commitment. So we understand how difficult this is for parents in particular at this time. And I think what we have to do, and I, De Debbie's uh, presentation previously of talking about what is the essence, and that's what we really want to get to, is thinking about what is really important about being a parent. I'm, many of you on this call are parents, and I'm sure you're doing a wonderful job. And I think one of the struggles is that it, previously, when we weren't dealing with a pandemic, when you have a baby, when you have a young child, you are inundated with so much information about how to be the best and perfect parent. You hear about brain development, you hear about the early years, you hear about the importance of stimulating development, of offering children extraordinary opportunities, of going to museums, it, it, being part of many sports programs, having play dates, and, and we know that socialization and all these activities, as long as they are balanced and they're not stressful, are wonderful for children. But now uh, many of these activities have had to be, be postponed for a period of time. Uh, and so we really need to get to what is the most important part of being a parent. And I think Debbie summarized it beautifully previously. When I thought about preparing this, I thought about Bruno Bettelheim, and some of you may be familiar with him. He was an Austrian child psychologist, and I love the title of this book. It was one of many, but A Good Enough Parent. And in it, his belief was that parents need to understand child development. And I'm sure along the way you've read, you've talked to your pediatric provider about what's important in child development at various stages. But he said, there are no rules that you as a parent with your child, with your children in your family must define what is important um, for you in that relationship in order to thrive. And so, as Debbie said, it's, it's not Life is not perfect, as we know, on a day-to-day -day basis, but uh, trying your best and certainly keeping in mind what is most important at this time is what's critical. And uh, we all know that parents and children have survived and thrived in the most challenging circumstances, and they do continually around the world. We know that uh, families are dealing with war and conflict previously and during the pandemic. Uh, we know from our parents and grandparents learning about the, great, the greatest generation in World War II and the sacrifices that individuals went through. And we know that many times people can endure these and actually thrive in these circumstances. It's very similar to thinking about if you're familiar with crisis theory. All of us have experienced crisis in our life perhaps personally, now we're dealing with it globally and sharing it as a global community. But how we manage that um, can actually make us all stronger, uh, children and families. I want to emphasize the importance of caring for yourself as a parent, a grandparent, one who's taking care of children, because I know that, that you are thinking about others first. And it is vital that you take some time for yourself. Uh, make sure that you are getting good nutrition, that you're getting sleep despite all of this. And you have, may have very, very little time to do this, but give yourself some time, uh, whether it's a long shower or a short run or whatever it takes, um, because your families are depending on you, but you need to take care of yourself first. Next slide, please. I just want to spend a moment talking about child care and preschool and the option of in-home care. And many families uh, are thinking about what, what is the best choice at this time? And this is a complicated question. And each one of these options that families may choose can have benefits as well as risks. And in each one of these choices, 
Uh, it's really important that, and I've, I'm sure you've heard the term pod or bubble, and that is that, that the limited number of people who are sort of within your pod or bubble are really committed to wearing masks, to doing appropriate social distancing, that are limiting travel, they're screening, screening in terms of, I'm sure you've been places where you get the standard number of questions asking about symptoms uh, for the potential that perhaps you um, have COVID or had it recently or in the past. And then the importance of contract tracing in some instances um, where routinely those who are exposed uh, maybe as often as a, every week or two are getting tested. Um, in terms of childcare, uh, childcare is really a dilemma in this country, and, and I'll talk a bit that, about that briefly um, in a few minutes. But uh, states do, you may be aware that states have childcare regulations and inspection reports, and in each state, uh, you should be able to have access to those inspection reports when you make decisions about whether um, your child is best in child care, in preschool, or best to be at home with a, a nanny or um, a babysitter uh, coming in to care for your children. Um, I've also had questions about, you know, what is the best educational approach in terms of uh, preschool and child care? And there are many educational approaches and there are benefits to each and some children respond better to some approaches rather than others. But what is the bottom line of all of this is that it these programs must be healthy and safe. Um, there has been an effort for the last 30 years through the um, U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, the Maternal Child Health Bureau, to set <laughs> best practice national standards um, for child care, preschool, across the country. And that reference is Caring for Our Children. Um, and you can find that online. It's a wonderful website and resource and really defines the best standards. The reason this was done was because we have very inconsistent regulations in the United States. So the minimum quality care in Massachusetts may be very different from Kansas or California or Tennessee. Um, and so this provides the best standard of what every program should have. Um, I just wanted to call your attention to uh, a couple of key factors in terms of determining quality care. And one of the most important is to have low ratios, and that means children to teachers. So for example, uh, an infant in less than 12 months, there should be no more than three infants being cared for by one teacher. And the maximum group size in that instance would be six. So therefore you would have two teachers in a classroom with the maximum of six. The group size is important because if you put a large number of children in a classroom with the appropriate ratio, it still is a very different dynamic. And I can't think of any group that that, uh, that be more of an issue than with toddlers. And that for those of you who've lived with toddlers between one and three, the two-year-olds um, are, are amazing and, and they will clearly rule in that situation with large groups. So it really is important to have a uh, maximum group size uh, for the toddlers of eight. And as you can see, three-year-olds about a seven to one, maximum group size of 14 and four to five-year-olds eight to one with a maximum group size of 16. Again, all of these standards are available in caring for our children. The other really important point about choosing quality care is look at teacher preparation. Teachers or child care providers, depending on how you refer to them, but they truly are teachers, are, um, should be prepared with a degree in child development or early childhood education. The other part that's really important is that there should be low turnover. A program where the teachers are uh, hired and maybe they last six months or a year and then they're gone again is of concern particularly for very young children, especially for infants and toddlers, and even to a degree to preschool children, <laughs> because children only learn in a context of a caring relationship. And, and as you can understand, your relationship with your young child is, is so vital. And during that time when they're in care, they need to develop a relationship with someone they trust. And to have constantly changing teachers presents a significant problem. So turnover is important and uh, certainly that concept of consistency of care. 
There's an organization called the National Education of the Education uh, for Young Children, and they have accreditation, and that also is one um, factor to consider uh, in terms of thinking about quality care because they do accredit specific uh, child care and early care programs. Next slide, please. Hi. So the question is, how do we protect everybody in the time of COVID? There are a few general principles. One is you have to develop trust, whether it's in your pod, in your bubble, in your classroom, because we so much depend on everybody to do the right thing. And the evidence keeps changing. What do you need? What don't you need? Do you need masks? Do you need distancing? Do you need PPE? Do you need air purifiers? Do you need cleaning? All these things are on the table. All these efforts are towards, as I said earlier, mitigation. You can't cure it. You can't get rid of it. But it's many, many, many layers of trying to diminish the chances of becoming ill. And so I've been involved lately with putting together the policies for the child care programs. What if a teacher gets sick? What if the teacher's child gets sick back home? What if the family travels? I'm in Vermont, but they go to Connecticut, to Rhode Island, to New York. What happens when they come back? So there's just so many issues, both in the household from whence they come, in the school, in the community. What, is the, what are the numbers in New Haven now and in the, the whole larger world? And those are so many factors and we can't control them all. So we try to control the things in our world that we can. So the screening is very, very useful. Depends on people being honest. Did they really travel or didn't they not travel? Have they had a visitor for, for Thanksgiving who came from somebody else, someplace else? So the screening is useful. And I think it helps remind everybody that these are important issues. They can't deny them. They shouldn't skirt around them. Ongoing surveillance means testing. And that's getting harder and harder to obtain because more and more people want it. Again, the government hasn't provided the resources to do it. It now takes a week in New Haven to get registered for a test. If I want to test now, I can't get it for a week. That's pretty awful if you're really trying to contain somebody who might be infected. So these issues vary community by community. At Yale, we have been able to have the teachers tested weekly. They were testing the undergraduates twice a week. And now they're testing the teachers weekly. And in fact, there was a case of a teacher who was completely asymptomatic, no risk factors, hadn't traveled, nobody sick in her family. She came up positive. And this was sad that she was positive, but very good because her class could be closed down well before lots of people got sick and well before the other classes uh, had to be closed. So screening is very, very important and surveillance. Uh, many folks have had worries about going to the doctor because there could be COVID should they have health checkups. For the youngest children, the checkups are very important and certainly anybody who needs immunizations, including the flu, should have their checkup. If you have a six to 10 year old who doesn't need a flu shot or anything else and is otherwise well, you could postpone that checkup for a few months, hoping that in the spring the numbers will improve. But the routine checkups for babies are important. It's crucial to keep them immunized fully and the vaccine is also important. Some people say, well, the flu vaccine is only good for 40 for 50% of the people. But in fact, it, it, it does have some mitigation effect on the flu. So even if you had the vaccine and got the flu, it's likely to be less, much less severe than otherwise. There's a lot of vaccine um, aversion in the, in the country. And um, I work hard whenever I can to convince people that the vaccines that we've had are safe and very, very, very useful. So the big push is to protect the families in their bubble and to keep the teachers and the staff at the child care programs and schools as safe as possible. Next slide. In the summer, I know this from personal experience at Yale, the programs were closed down in March. And then the question was how to open them up again. So we spent a lot of time, again, thinking of the mitigation procedures. And it was dealing with um, testing the teachers and then all these indoor safety things. And I've learned more than I ever thought I'd learn about 
ventilation, but it really can be helpful in a classroom. The cleaning and sanitizing has less priority now, but people are still rightfully being very, very cautious. I think in the case of care for young children, they talk about spacing the teachers and the children and the families. So parents aren't allowed in the school. When they come to school in the morning, they get a screening. Many places have appointments, make sure you stay separate. However, realistically, the kids under two aren't masked. And you tell me any toddlers who could stay six feet apart. It's a very, very difficult scene. So although those are good policies for big kids, when you're dealing with children in childcare, it means you have to be extra, extra, extra careful about testing the teachers and their wearing masks and their lives as much as possible outside the school to be safe. Outdoor learning time is, outdoor time is very important. I live, I'm in Vermont now. It was 12 degrees wind chill yesterday. You aren't gonna put children out in that kind of weather and it's gonna get worse, winter's just starting. So depending on where you live, this is again the context, you have to say what is realistic given where we are in the community that we're live, living in. Next slide. What we're gonna do is now shift to some questions that have been sent to us previously. And after this, we'll open it up um, for all of your questions. Uh, the questions that were sent seem to revolve around these four categories, health and safety of children and families, child care, preschool versus home care, and short and long impact term impact on development, children's perceptions and fears, <clears throat> and finally balancing work and family. Next slide, please. The number one priority, and I'm sure you all know this, is the health of children and families. Parents often ask, how do I balance health and socialization? We all know that socialization is critical for children, for all of us, we're social beings. But our number one priority must be health at this point. So I think what we need to do, and you already know the answer, is to be flexible about how can we maintain um, the recommendations of the masks, the social distancing, um, and I know many of us uh, that have really been doing much more outside. And of course, those in the Northern Hemisphere um, have been uh, enjoying the spring and summer and fall. And now uh, in Connecticut and uh, the Northern United States, now we're dealing with how it will be in winter, but how can we remain outside as much as possible? Again, this is very difficult as we move into the holidays where people are needing to make some really hard choices about really questioning whether we can in any way um, think about gathering together. And really the answer is clearly we can't. We can't gather in large groups other than those basically that are in our household. As far as the symptoms of COVID-19, I'm sure you are very familiar uh, with all of these fever, cough, shortness of breath, chills, sometimes difficulty um, uh, with aches, uh, aches and muscle pains, headaches, sore throat. And of course, we've all heard about loss of appetite and smell. Some people experience gastro enteritis, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. Some people have all of these symptoms, some have none of these symptoms. So how do you distinguish from other common illnesses? Well, honestly, you don't. Uh, it is very similar, as you know, to upper respiratory infections, to colds, um, to the flu, uh, to stomach viruses. And so when do you seek health care? I think you should, with any of these symptoms, your healthcare provider should welcome your questions, whether for you or your children, and they can help you sort out whether or not um, you need to uh, be tested. What is the potential long-term impact for children and adults? We honestly don't know. I'm sure that you have read about adults that have had serious, serious infections, who've been hospitalized, been in intensive care units, been um, intubated, and they are experiencing long-term effects. We are learning about this new virus as the months go on. In terms of children, as Debbie said, and as I'm sure you're aware, we're grateful that far fewer children um, have had the illness, have had symptoms of the illness. We now know that 
you know, in one study in the American Academy of Pediatrics said that about a million children in one study were asymptomatic. But what are the long-term impacts? Um, uh, Debbie shared with me the other day that in a lecture she had heard uh, through an infectious disease expert at Yale, that there seemed to be a case of carditis and inflammation of the heart um, a few months after a child had COVID-19 and it wasn't necessarily a child with a very serious illness. So we don't know what this is. And that's why, again, the mitigation is absolutely the priority. What are the long-term effects of quarantining on the immune system? This is not an issue because we're not in a sterile bubble. We still are in an environment with a, a smaller number of people where we can actually share viruses. Um, so I think our immune systems will be intact. Um, next slide, please. In terms of what your choice is, it depends a lot on what's available and what your resources are. So far, we've been focusing on people who have a choice. And if you go to the childcare programs at Yale, you have pretty much you have some, except for some unusual instances of families on full scholarship, somebody has a job and they can pay at least a good portion of the tuition, but huge numbers of people do not have that. The inequalities and inequities are horrible. So is there an ideal choice? Maybe <clears throat> there isn't because every child is different psychologically, developmentally, perhaps physically. Every family circumstances are different. Do they have work? How much money do they have? Where do they live? What's available? In terms of having in-home care, there are many, many benefits. It can be very individualized. The child can sleep and eat whenever you say the child can take a nap. However, the nanny or the babysitter, unless they're full-time in your bubble, they're out there in the world. So they could get sick. And so you have to have a certain amount of trust and understanding of what their life is and their contagious possibilities are. Child care can be very good. And there've been thousands of studies about that. If it's good quality, the teachers are trained if there's consistency. It's very important that whatever you think are good principles for child rearing that the school basically agrees. If you're pretty permissive, you don't want your child in a very restrictive environment because the child will feel that pull and tug and not and be confused by that. So it's important to know the philosophy of this program and the school. And the other thing is not every program is gonna be the same for all of your children, same in terms of a good fit. So you have to think of your particular child and their kind of personality. Sometimes you have no choice. You have to work, you have to find childcare, whether it's a relative or a friend in the home or a publicly funded program outside or a privately funded one. So you have to figure out what's best for you. Thinking about health and safety and the psychological development. I'm not so concerned about how many books there are, but I'm very concerned about how they treat the children and the attitude about psychological development. The screen question comes up tremendously. Certainly my uh, grandchildren who are in elementary school are on remote in Brooklyn. And so they're on the screen many, many more hours a day than they would ordinarily be. And then they wanna visit their friends and play some games. So it's a, always a compromise. You do your work and then you can have some screen time, but you have to have some time when they're not on the screen. Nobody knows what the long-term effect of this is. I think if they have a rich life off the screen, then when the remote gets changed to in-person learning, that won't be such a worry. So I would err on the side of permissiveness in the sense they do their work, they have some time with their friends on the screen, but there's some time when they're doing non-screen things, things with the family or the siblings, whatever seems appropriate for that child at that age and that personality. Next slide. We talked a little bit about how parents should talk to young children. I know some friends with grandchildren as young as three who really did get the picture. You wear a mask because it's good for you and good for everybody else. And the younger children even reminding the parents, young kids want to do what's right and they will model what their parents do so that if the parents are consistent and calm and secure and sure, the kids will follow. The holiday limiting friends is really a big one. And I think you have to be very, very, very cautious. It's hard. It's really 
horrible. Um, in terms of preschool and elementary, we talked about their verbal abilities and abstract thinking and what their needs are. Definitely limit play dates. You can play outside, but keep distancing. So if the weather's good, you have a lot of activities, but um, it's, it does become limited by the weather. I have a daughter who is a music teacher and she had her band meet in Prospect Park and they had this whole delightful visit, but they were six feet apart and they had masks. So you can imagine this mob of, of school age kids with their trumpets and trombones. Um, Angela, you go ahead. Yes, um, just wanted to talk just a, for a couple of minutes about balancing work and family. We want to save time for the end. Uh, we said this to some degree, but again, I uh, want to remember that we're fortunate if we have this choice, that it depends on the circumstance of the families. Some parents may not be able to have one parent at home. Again, all of this is individual. Um, you know, in terms of role and risk for grandparents, grandparents who live with families play, can play an absolutely vital role in helping with children, but obviously there's concerns about their uh, risk uh, in terms of developing complications of COVID and particularly those with chronic conditions. Uh, for single parent families, they define who are the members of their family and who are their resources. Again, it's consistent with maintaining your pod or your bubble. I do want to come back to uh, last uh, talking about how this pandemic clearly is creating chronic long-term stress. And I'm going to just say one more time that is so important for parents to take care of themselves physically and mentally. We know that anxiety and depression can be very common in our society and urge those who are feeling that overwhelmed by all of this to see counseling. To see counseling is really a strength and something that everyone deserves when they have um, these needs. I thought we wanted to end this portion by saying that the pandemic certainly highlights the inequities across our families, communities, and societies. I expect that most people on this call have been very fortunate to have resources um, to have people in our network, to have families uh, to, that we can weather this, and, but also to be very aware of those, our fellow citizens across the country, across the globe, who are dealing with um, loss of employment, homelessness, hunger. And I know that all of you are, are very concerned about that as well. Um, last slide, please. Um, I, there's much that could be said about childcare, and I only want to say briefly because I'm sure that you have been reading in the New York Times and the New Yorker and the Atlantic and other articles about what effect this pandemic has had on childcare. And just briefly, before the pandemic, we had at least 12 million children who were in childcare of some form outside the home. At least 66% of mothers of preschool children, 80% of mothers of school age, and 96% of fathers uh, with children less than 18 were in the workforce. We had a very low unemployment rate, as you know, before March. Um, but what has been interesting about childcare in this country is that there has been, and always has been, as opposed to other countries, very minimal federal support. It is only 0.5% of our GDP. As a result, for decades, parents have been responsible for finding and paying for healthy, safe, and developmentally appropriate care. There are resource and referral agencies in every state, but parents really bear the burden of finding good care, and it is very expensive care. Before the pandemic, childcare in this country was fragmented, inequitable, inaccessible, and underfunded. Um, and we know that this pandemic is having a profound effect on childcare across this country. At least 40 to 50% of childcare programs closed in the spring and many have not opened. Um, even though work may change in the future in terms of working more at home versus on site, parents clearly need care um, in order to really uh, function effectively. And so this is an important topic um, that really deserves some deliberation. Next slide. I just wanted to point out that there are resources um, and there are many other resources that may be useful for you uh, to explore after um, this talk. And we're gonna move now to the question and answer uh, portion.
Good. So if you have questions, submit them in the chat. Um, we'll start with um, one of the questions we had, which was kind of covered obliquely, but we'll address it directly, which is that, um, you know, it, it sounds like it's coming from someone who's a grandparent caring for a one-year-old grandchild who goes to daycare. And they were inquiring if they should wear a mask around the child and if there's any effect of wearing the mask and child development. <laughs> Well, I think it goes back, Deb, you and I can- you, you can start. I have a thought from my own experience at EBJ. Ah, okay. Well, I mean, I, I just go back to the principles of um, what this child care is do, program is doing in terms of mitigating. Uh, that's gonna be very important and that would have to be examined. Um, and then, you know, is there risk? There could be risk, absolutely. Um, if could the child be developed, uh, uh, actually become contagious, it may be asymptomatic and bring it home. And then the question is, that does the parent, is that grandparent going to wear the mask um, out of abundance of caution? Uh, Debbie, I'll let you take it from here. I, if somebody, if I were somebody's pediatrician and they asked me that, I would say, yes, please wear a mask. The next question is, how will the child know who I am and what will the long-term effect be? Nobody has any studies on this, but we've had lots and lots of conversations at EBJ. One thing to do is when you're not, you know, it depends how well you know the child, but you can certainly have pictures of the grandparent with and without the mask because a one-year-old can look at a picture book. And at the daycare, we have the teachers have a big picture on a pin, like a, well, anyway, a picture on their smock so that the child knows who it is. Um, I think if you knew your grandchild before, they'll remember who you are. Their right. voice, your smell, your emotions, the way you talk. If I were the grandparent there, I would wear a mask. I think it is worth the caution because if you got sick, it would be a horrible burden on the whole family. Right. I just want to add one other point. When when the uh, child care programs reopened at Yale, I asked this question of the directors because they all had to wear a mask and particularly those that were with infants and toddlers. And one of the wonderful directors said that what she would do is that she would step away more than six feet. She'd pull the mask down. And so the child would see her face, would see her expressions. And, and over the last few months, they've told me that children have adapted so wonderfully to the mask. It's really been amazing. But there are so many techniques, as Debbie also mentioned. Uh, we have one other question uh, that just came in from Maria. She says she's a mother of a two-year-old uh, and she was hoping to, uh, wait a minute, implant. Im implant a second embryo this summer. I have continued breastfeeding for immune support and thought dangerous to be immune suppressed pregnant. Does breastfeeding still have immune benefit at this age? What are some of the considerations for getting pregnant or taking unproven vaccine pregnant? <laughs> Woo, complicated. A lot of questions. <laughs> I think I have a little bit of an answer, not much. Right. In terms of implanting an embryo, that depends on your personal circumstance. Um, how urgent is it? What are the risks in your community? And what support do you have? because during a pregnancy, you may need extra support. And where will you get that? That would be a question I would ask. Um, I don't know much about, I don't know if anybody does, about breastfeeding. Were you thinking that this would protect the two-year-old? I don't think there's any information from that about COVID. And of course, if the mother has never had COVID, she would not have any antibodies to COVID. I've not seen any reports about that. I've seen lots of reports of healthy pregnancies and healthy deliveries and hospitals now screen all the pregnant women who are coming in. So I think that there are risks added to being pregnant and then risks added to being pregnant in a pandemic depends on your support and your personal circumstances and the urgency of this whole thing. So that's a long answer to a complicated question. And I would assume that the obstetrician uh, would be uh, the best resource in terms and the fertility expert in terms of implanting and what is the best. And the answer is gonna change in a few months because it's changing daily. Yes. Okay. We have another, oh, sorry, Elaine. 
the, my, uh, the, another question is from uh, Alice who says, my daughter's two and automatically knows to stop walking and stay six feet away from everyone. This is good for social distancing, but should we be concerned about how this is affecting her development? She has no siblings, so does not really play with other kids because she doesn't go to daycare. Well, I'd say she's amazingly smart <laughs> and I am sure she's gonna to adapt to whatever is next. I mean, you remember also that two-year-olds are really doing parallel play with other children. Um, and it's always a value to some degree for children to be together, but it's, it is more important for preschool children. And I don't know, you know if there are opportunities for her to see children from a distance, but I, the relationship with the parent is the most important at this time. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Then, um, there's a couple questions. So there's one, we'll, we'll get to the bulk of these, but one of them is, um, what's the youngest age that you would recommend kids start wearing masks? And I know there's national guidance on it, but uh, curious to, to hear you, you know, both of your expert kind of insights and personal insights. Angela, yeah. Well, the, the recommendation is children under two should not be wearing masks because they're concerned that they actually could choke um, with them. So uh, it really is over age two, and that seems to make sense. I think honestly, from three on, uh, children can really manage it best. Deb, what are your thoughts about I, that? I would agree, I would agree. And this is like many of the recommendations that their judgment, there's not a lot of data, but I would say that right. three and up, yes, and two to three, if he under two, not necessary. Right. Um, we also had a question about uh, the child care ratio between workers and children. Someone asked how the size is determined and why not a larger or a smaller group? How, how is that ratio decided? Oh, okay. well, it really is de decided on child development principles. And when caring for our children, which has gone through about four editions, it really is based on evidence. And um, it really it, it is looking at basically child development principles. How much time, how can you give quality time and attention to each child? Um, so the, the group size dynamic is important. And you know, if there are smaller sizes and there are lower ratios, uh, that's even better. Uh, I visit uh, or I did visit on a regular basis the Yale child care programs, which are wonderful programs, and I'm sure there are wonderful programs in, in the states where you live. Um, but sometimes I would even see a one to two ratio uh, because in our programs, because of the nature of it being the university, parents would come in at different times. But the, the smaller the ratios, the smaller the group size, the more the teacher can give individual attention to each child. I would also say that, especially for the kids three and up, there's a lot of social pressure in terms of groups and the dynamics between the children. So that inevitably there's gonna be a child who's more needy or more bossy. And the bigger the group, the more stress. I know if I personally, maybe I'm relatively shy, but if I'm in a very big group and have to deal with a lot of people all at once, it's very hard. And I think most children really need some place. It could be after school when they're home and they're not dealing with all those pressures. So I think, again, as Angela said, it depends how much time and energy the staff can give. I know that the ratio, what did you put up, Angela, was seven to one. I couldn't take care of seven. Three I, know. I mean, it's, it's really very, very difficult. Not that I couldn't have a program where they were organized and perhaps regimented and compliant, but all you need is one child who's needy, what happens to the other six? So those are recommendations, but less is gotta be better. Yes, absolutely. And we had a question on um, how, one thing that I think maybe we best address, um, maybe the follow-up email to participants, is a lot of people have been asking for specific book resources for parenting in general, and also parenting during COVID that you both would recommend. So if that's something Okay. You all would feel comfortable, you know, thinking about putting together a few resources we could email to people because I'm sure putting you on the spot right now might be tough. Right. But if you feel ready, we can come back to that. But first, we'll do a question on um, how should parents manage social development needs with kindergartners who have been doing school remote only? Uh, they've moved to a new town and they're not sure how to integrate into the community with COVID going on. Mm -hmm. I, I have a few thoughts of that. I have very close friends. They're 
could be my cousins, and they have a five-year-old who had been very part-time in preschool, had experience with neighbors and friends, and he lives in Minnesota. And he has gone to a kindergarten in a Montessori school, and they have done a hybrid. So about half of the children are in person, and about half of the children are remote. And it's been very, very interesting, that question of how do you integrate this child who's at home with the other kids? It's tricky. And they've had this, this school has arranged to have some outdoor programs. Usually it's on the weekend when the parents were not working in a park and games and things that these kids could do. And so they got to see each other in person, even though with masks, and these were the kids who had been either on remote or in school. So they've been able to get them together in this situation. Also, the connection with the teacher is very important. So the teacher has had individual time with these remote kids, and that's been helpful. And then if she brings in some of the in-person kids into those sessions, it helps again. So it's second best, but it's not bad. And this little boy, Leo, clearly knows who some of his in-person classmates are. Great. And now it's hard for the parents, for sure, to be in a different town. That's that's a challenge. Uh, we have another question, uh, Deb and Angela, regarding a couple that are divorced with a seven-year-old. Uh, and the seven-year-old has already had to quarantine due to exposure at her school. And she quarantined with her mother um, at her mother's home for 12 days. But the mom was wondering... Uh, if it were to happen again, can she go to her dad's house? It says he's remarried, his wife is pregnant, so they are on high alert. I worry the time away from her dad on top of all the stress and anxiety surrounding distance learning and being quarantined and ha will have a serious negative effect on her. So well, I, I think you just... Yeah, life experiences that people are challenged with. Right. Uh, yeah. Again, you just have to assess each household and where is the safest place for everyone. And it seems in that case uh, that the dad uh, with his wife and, and her concerns may be more of a, an issue than, than in her own home. Again, it, it could be a problem, certainly for the mom, in term, it's a greater burden for her, but I guess they need to uh, negotiate what is really going to be the best. I have a, another practical solution, which is just a suggestion, not a solution. If they decide that the child, the seven-year-old stays with the mom because of the pregnancy in the other household, they could really beef up the remote contact with the father and preserve yeah. the stepmother Absolutely. using Zoom, using stories, using FaceTime. It's not the same, but they remain in contact. And the seven-year-old hopefully has a pretty strong connection to the dad. And so this will, this will, I believe, definitely survive. It's a question of the attitude of the grown-ups. That's what counts. Right. I just wanted to mention that I um, have a very good friend who lives in Florida and her grandchildren live in Switzerland and they have always lived in Switzerland and they have a very, very close relationship pre-pandemic. They have FaceTime once a week and they come to visit, not this year, but in the past for a month. They go, they have one visit a year and they have an extraordinarily close relationship. So we're so fortunate we have this technology. It's not the same as being in person, but it really can get us through and keep everybody healthy and safe. Great, um, that's, that's very helpful. And it's kind of a good kind of moving towards our conclusion. I think we have one more question we'll cover. And then if you guys would like to provide resources verbally, or if you want to do that as follow-up, um, I'll leave that to your discretion. Um, but the last one is an important question, kind of for broader society, basically just touching on the inequities that you both addressed in the deck, that this is something that is inevitable in a situation like this. What can we all do to help address these in our local communities? I think many of us um, are learning about uh, what are the issues in our community. Many uh, communities have community foundations um, that are seeking support uh, around nutrition, homelessness. Certainly, uh, funding is critical. And people, it may not be appropriate to give in-person assistance, but we can certainly provide support uh, through those resources. We may belong to faith communities that are mobilizing, so there may be many places in the community that are seeking our assistance. And certainly when we come out of this, 
um, there will be much work to be done then, and we can do it more personally when we're all protected uh, with the vaccine. Oh, thank you so much. I think we're just about at the end of our time here today, and we really appreciate all your questions. I think I appreciate so much uh, what Angela and um, and Deborah said about how difficult it is for everyone. This is a very stressful time, and there are really good resources out there uh, and important to seek them out if folks are feeling terribly stressed because it does have an effect on the children as well. Uh, thank you all for your uh, attention and for being here with us and a special thanks to Angela and Deb for, uh, for their time and all of their expertise. My pleasure. Great, thank you. It's been a wonderful experience. Okay. Good thank luck you. and stay healthy. Thank you everyone. Thanks everyone, bye now. Bye.